Mr. Scrooge, I presume. Indeed you do, sir. You don't know us. Nor do I wish to. My name is Poole, and this is Mr. Hackett. Excellent. Now, if you'll allow me to pass. Uh, let me explain, sir. At this festive season of the year, it seems desirable that those of us with means should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this time. Provision? Are you seeking money from me then? Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. The workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill, the poor houses, still in full vigor? All very busy, sir. <laughs> I was afraid from what you said that something had stopped them in full force. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and food and warmth. Oh, what can we put you down for, sir? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. My taxes help to support the public institutions which I have mentioned, and they cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, perhaps they had better do so and uh, decrease the surplus population. Surely you don't mean that, sir. With all my heart. Now, if you will go about your business, gentlemen, and allow me to go about mine. Okay. Good evening and welcome everyone to our December 15th town hall meeting where we hope to explore the scrooginess of a Federal Reserve induced recession with the benefits that can be derived from establishing a national infrastructure bank. My name is Julie Olson and I'll be the moderator of our panel this evening. I'm a business person from the Pacific Northwest and the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. We have a great lineup of speakers tonight, and uh, we're going to get right to it, and we'll give everyone an opportunity for Q&A at the end of our presentations. Uh, so our first speaker uh, tonight is Alfeka Mutardi. She's a macroeconomist, formerly with the International Monetary Fund, uh, and out of uh, Fairfax, Virginia. We'll go right to Alfeka for an overview of the National Infrastructure Bank. Great, thank you very much and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you again. Uh, we want to uh, get together just before Christmas and discuss what our biggest Christmas wish is for a National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I'd like to open by uh, giving you a kind of a rundown or a, a, an update, a quick update on where we are with the economy and Scrooge's Fed policy that will cause a recession. Uh, and then also give you an update on where we are with the National Infrastructure Bank. So um, we uh, are not looking too good on the economy, uh, although inflation is somewhat lower uh, this month for November than it was the, the month before, uh, it is still high, 7.1% um, uh, year over year. Uh, the, the cause of the uh, inflation is corporate profit taking and supply shortages. Wages are not contributing that much to our inflation. We do have a tight labor market. Uh, unemployment is unchanged uh, this month in November at 3.7%, but we still have three and a half million workers less now in our workforce than we did before the pandemic began. And to add on insult to injury, the Fed is pursuing its reckless policy to tamp down on the economy, on employment. It thinks that's the way to solve the inflation problem. Uh, here's a picture of Jerome Powell just yesterday announcing that he was going to raise interest rates by another half a percent. Uh, now it gets them all the way up to 4%. That's the rate at which the Fed lends to banks so that they can on lend at a higher rate. Uh, that's going to caused the, the, uh, the economy to run to a screeching halt. Uh, he also admits that inflation next year with his policy of increasing rates will still be almost twice as much as his target rate. That means he's gonna have to keep on raising rates 
uh, further uh, to supposedly tamp down on inflation. And the real question is, does it even work? Um, we What we know is that a lot of economists, including uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, say that the uh, this will definitely, this policy will definitely cause a recession, and it's not even sure if it will cure inflation. What is for sure, though, is that it'll crush small businesses and medium-sized businesses. They'll have to fire workers. Uh, state and local finances will plummet again. The banking sector, which is also already teetering uh, because it has a lot of bad paper on its books, uh, including $40 trillion of currency derivatives that are off off of its books and holding on somebody else's books. If it uh, goes haywire, it could really cause a big problem in the financial sector, plus bad corporate debt. And that this is also gonna affect the stock market. Here's what happened to the stock market right here on, on the day that Jerome Powell was talking about his interest rate policy. So it's a bad Fed policy, uh, it's a Scrooge policy, and it probably won't even cure inflation because it won't cure the supply side. High, higher interest rates make it harder for companies to borrow and invest and create new supplies. And then there's a looming food crisis due to a drought in the Southwest, uh, which co could cause huge spikes in food prices over the next few years. And if we have a recession, we can't uh, uh, get out of it with borrowing uh, from, uh, from the budget again because our, our debt at 31 trillion is so high. So what Christmas present do we need? We need a National Infrastructure Bank, HR 3339. It is large enough at $5 trillion to build all of our nation's infrastructure, it directs credit, banking credit, uh, to promote the general welfare, build out housing, power, efficient transportation, clean water, and all without any recourse to net federal taxes, deficits, or spending. That means this legislation is actually appealable to both Republicans, conservative Democrats. It actually has a chance of getting passed. And if we have a recession, this policy can lean against the recession by hiring up all these workers, retraining them, moving into family sustaining jobs to build out infrastructure. It'll make America make again. We can manufacture here. Let's get the economy rolling and get businesses rolling. Uh, it'll vastly stimulate production, bring on new supply. And guess what? With new supply, that will bring down the inflation rates. And for goodness sake, let's get water to our farmers uh, and uh, who are growing our food. And uh, let's switch over to growing food sustainably while we're doing that. So that's the update on the economy. Just wanted to tell you where we are with the bill. Uh, we currently have 19 co-sponsors on our bill. The last one that we brought on was uh, uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell from California in uh, mid uh, November. Uh, we haven't been successful at bringing on uh, other co-sponsors, but the way this works is each time you legislators and political activists go to your members of Congress and ask for them to sign on the bill, this works. It percolates at a different rate of uh, state to state, but it actually does work. So we're laying a lot of groundwork right now, meeting with uh, members of Congress all across the country, and all of you are helping in this effort. So for those new on the call, this is a quick rundown of how the National Infrastructure Bank works. It is capitalized by the private sector contributing in treasuries that they're holding in exchange for preferred stock, they get paid a little bit extra, and that, that capital sits on the bank's books, and then the bank goes and gives out loans exactly the same way that a commercial bank actually creates money on the spot each time that it gives out a loan, gives out very low-cost loans, and helps uh, state and local governments who are requesting loans to formulate them to get the best infrastructure projects rolling out the door. Five trillion in projects we cover to repair transportation, water systems, upgrade the electric power grid. These are all the categories that the that the American Society of Civil Engineers say over the next 10 years, we need new money for it to fix. They're absolutely essential. And then we added some categories of our own high-speed rail, broadband everywhere, affordable housing, targeted to the very lowest income earners who need them the most, and then these large-scale water projects to address drought in the Southwest where we grow our food. And keep in mind, our bill will finance all of our needs at $5 trillion, like this is expressed in billions of dollars, and comparing that to the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed last year, it's a great start, 
but unfortunately only has one tenth of the money that we need to top up the financing. So the National Infrastructure Bank will top up and finance what is not being financed by the federal budget or state and local budgets. So it, again, just to repeat, this bank's operations are so large, this bank at $5 trillion is so large that it, it can move the needle on the economy. It can create 25 million new great paying jobs, buy America only, will make America manufacture again. We could get our GDP growth up to 5% per year on average. Keep Compare that to the latest forecast for growth over the next 10 years, only 1.5% per year in growth. That's anemic. And we need to get the growth rate up and we need to make our economy more productive. Again, all we can do this all with no new federal taxes, deficits, or spending, and we'll reduce inflation by increasing the supply of goods that are produced, and we can offset any coming recession. So I'd like to again encourage you to uh, discuss and think about ways that you're promoting the bill in your various uh, jurisdictions, and uh, then I'll now I'll turn it over to uh, um, Ellen Brown, who will tell you a little bit more about how this works and how it rebuilds the economy. Thank you very much. So we're very fortunate to have with us this evening Ellen Brown, who is the chair of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles. She's an author and co-host of a radio show on PRN FM. It's our money. Uh, Ellen, uh, you've got the floor. Okay, thanks. I would like to point out that um, uh, public banking is really, or the interest in public banking is really seeing a resurgence around the country. So there are uh, multiple states wherein there are groups actively pursuing legislation to create their own public state bank. So currently we have the very successful Bank of North Dakota, a public bank that's functioned in that state for over 50 years, uh, very successfully. And um, so Ellen is an expert and she's worked with many of these groups around the country in establishing public banks. So Ellen? Uh, so as so Ellen pointed out, uh, the, uh, Jerome Powell yesterday gave his report, they're raising interest rates by half a percentage point uh, mm -hmm. to, to between 4.25 and 4.5%, mm -hmm. the highest level since December of 2007. And they're projecting a peak of 5.1% next year and hopefully coming down to 4.1% in 2024. So it's not a pivot. It's, they're not turning around, certainly not, no time soon. Um, the theory of Powell and the Fed is that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, too much money chasing too few goods, but the only thing that the Fed has control over is the money. And so that's why they're trying to reduce demand, too much demand for the amount of supply. And it does that by raising interest rates and by selling assets into the market. Um, but as Elfeka pointed out, uh, this forces small and medium-sized businesses that also need um, credit at a reasonable rate to go out of business. It, would, it forces worker layoffs and reduce productivity. I mean, they, the Fed actually wants worker layoffs, but the problem is if, if you lay off the workers, you're not producing stuff, so productivity is going down at the same time. And so many people, many pundits, including Jerome Powell, or I mean, sorry, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, think that we're heading for a recession or maybe even some have said a depression. Um, but there's some commentators that think that the Fed's goal is something else. I mean, they're not stupid and they, um, you know, they, <laughs> they only hire fairly intelligent people, supposedly. Uh, so the other possibility is that they're trying to break the Fed put. The Fed put is the notion that the Fed will always step in with free money or easy money, quantitative easing, to backstop the market, which basically means a speculative market like uh, housing, stock market, etc. Um, but the problem is that, the, and they have done this routinely, but the problem is that it actually widens the wealth gap because because of the Cantillon effect, which is that the, the parties that get the money first, like big banks or big financial institutions, get it very cheaply, but then they can turn around and like banks can get it at 0.25% and they can still charge 17 or 18% on their credit cards. So they're, they're getting that huge spread. They're getting richer, but the, um, the people without those advantages are not. So it increases the 
so uh, the wealth gap. So um, the argument we, we've heard for like a, at least a decade that the Fed has been kicking the can down the road, that they never fix this problem um, that they created with the, the Fed put. You can see in the gray lines on this chart, this is the Fed funds rate. The, the gray uh, lines are recessions. And every time we have a recession, then the Fed jumps in and lowers the interest rate and that's supposed to fix it. Uh, it was called originally called the Greenspan put, and because Greenspan did it uh, most famously in 2000, you can't tell too well on this chart. But anyway, in 2000, uh, that was the dot com bubble when it collapsed. Then Greenspan jumped in and that reduced the rate to around two percent, and then it um, they tried to ra rate oh. They raised it. I'm sorry, I can't even read this chart. Oh, so around 2005, as I recall, 2006, they they tried to raise the rate. They raised it to four or five percent, and that triggered the um, bust in the mortgage-backed securities market because uh, subprime borrowers couldn't afford the higher rates. And so once again, the Fed jumped in this time with quantitative easing. Uh, which was a first, they hadn't done qu quantitative easing before, and dropped the rate all the way down to 0.25%, like virtually nothing. And that carried on for quite a while until 2015. And then it, they tried to raise the rate in 2019. They tried to raise the rate and they had another crisis. In September 2019, there was a, a crisis in the repo market where the rates went up to 10%, which is it's too, typically about 2%. So those are the rates at which banks borrow if they don't have the liquidity to cover their loans, which they typically don't. So without that, the whole financial system once again would have collapsed. And so the Fed jumped in and and um, and put a floor on the repo market. And the, you can't see the chart, but anyway, it didn't win. Then with COVID, it went all the way down almost to zero or from zero to 0.25%, so very low. And now it's they're trying to raise it again. So they're trying to do what they've tried to do numerous times. And there's a question whether it will work. But anyway, that's the argument that that's what they're trying to do. Uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth, who is a former advisor to Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher, said in, a, in an interview about a, a week ago, he, she said, uh, if Jay Powell breaks the Fed put and takes away the unfair ability of private capital to rape and pillage the system, he will have finally addressed income inequality in America. Well, that will do, I mean, that's good that it will, it could do something like that. But the problem is who's going to pay for this? It will still be everybody, you know, the lower 80% who don't have those investments. Um, it's not just the big investors, but small and medium-sized businesses that need easy credit and home buyers. Um, there, in uh, October 31st, uh, a team of Democratic senators, including Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, wrote a letter to Chairman Powell, um, noting consistent with its plan to raise interest rates into next year and weaken economic growth. The Fed projects that unemployment will rise sharply from 3.7% today to 4.4% in 2023 and 2024. I mean, that doesn't sound terrible, but the implication, they say, is an additional 1.2 million people losing their jobs. And that's actually what the Fed wants. They want people to be unemployed so they don't have money to spend. But if they don't have money to spend then businesses won't be receiving money, so they'll have to go out of business. They won't be producing. I mean, it's a it's a failed policy. The problem is it's not demand pull um, inflation. It's cost push inflation. It's triggered by, first, it was the lockdowns where 200,000 small and medium-sized businesses were forced to close their doors. And meanwhile, the Congress, um, not a bad idea, actually paid out COVID relief payments to um, to individuals and to unemployment benefits. So the people were still getting some money, but the, they weren't working. So they weren't producing things. So you had uh, demand staying relatively level, but supply dropping way down. And then we had all these supply chain disruptions because that spread around the world. And then um, just recently, the wartime sanctions, where we purposely cut ourselves off from certain international <laughs> um, su supply sources. 
Um, so even if you argue, and maybe there is a good argument, that the relief money from COVID contributed to inflation, that money is gone now, and we're not getting those payments anymore. And um, producers can't just keep dropping their prices because they have to cover their costs. So if if their costs stay high, they have to just go out of business. And that's what's happening. Um, and there is an alternative, which is the National Infrastructure Bank alternative. And this is what Roosevelt did to pull us out of the Great Depression. And we can do that again. Uh, so we can actually put people back to work and increase the money supply without creating inflation if the money is going for productive purposes. So with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Roosevelt, uh, the, it was originally, it was a public financing institution. It started out with 500 million in capitalization, so a modest amount relatively. And over the next 25 years, it lent or invested over $40 billion, um, turning a profit for the government, funding the New Deal and World War II, and all without creating consumer price inflation. As you can see here, if you can see the numbers, it, inflation didn't really start till the 70s. Uh, and why was that? Because this money went for productive purposes. So you had supply increasing along with demand, so they stayed in balance. Today, the stellar model is China, which went from one of the poorest countries in the world to global economic powerhouse in four decades. Um, China's public development involved huge injections of credit, but it was not inflationary. The money supply grew 1,800% in 23 years, yet prices remained stable. And why was that? Because um, GDP shot up at the same rate. So again, you had supply and demand remaining in balance. Of course, China has these big development banks where they issued the money, built projects, and then the the proceeds from the projects paid back the loans. So we could do that again with a national infrastructure bank. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ellen. Um, those last slides that you had were really very um, illuminating in terms of uh, uh, drawing out for us the conclusion on the benefits that we can see from a national infrastructure bank. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, another one of our experts, and that is the esteemed Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance from Cornell uh, University, Professor Robert Hockett. Oh, hey guys, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Angela. Thanks again for having me with you guys. Um, I can't uh, by any stretch uh, improve on what uh, Ellen has just said or on what Alfeca said before, but I can try to maybe sort of supplement it a little bit or sort of provide a few complimentary remarks that um, sort of fill in um, a few of the sort of gaps sort of between what they were able to talk about in the very little time that they've been given. Um, so as, as Ellen notes, um, you know, usually you don't have terrible inflationary problems with the growth of the money supply unless you don't have something else, namely a growth in production, right, to accompany it. And ideally, the way an economy grows in a stable fashion uh, is that basically the money supply grows roughly in tandem with or in sort of lockstep with productive capacity, right? So the, the more you're producing, the more money you're issuing, that money that's issued is typically in a healthy situation is issued precisely in order to finance that production so that the people who are then doing the producing are actually earning incomes as well that they can then use to purchase that which they are producing. And if you end up having an imbalance in either direction, either too much production without enough actual money being um, uh, issued in order to enable those who are doing the producing to buy what they're producing, you end up getting a stoppage in the system that's called a deflation. Um, and if by contrast, you end up sort of issuing too much money, but not actually issuing it in productive directions or in productive ways, then of course you get inflation. And this is all that's being got at by um, sort of familiar uh, witticisms like inflation is too much money chasing too few goods, right? That itself tells you right off the bat that what we're really dealing with is a relation between two quantities. And hence, I often uh, tell my students that inflation is a relation because it's sort of easy to remember that. And it also captures the essence of the thing, right? It's a relation between money supplies and goods supplies. 
Now, uh, as Ellen pointed out also, um, you know, we have this unfortunate um, uh, witticism of Milton Friedman's that people still quote uh, approvingly as though it were true, right? They quote it as though it were a truism. And what Friedman said was that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. But it's, it's pretty easy to see on the basis of what both Alfeca and Ellen have said and on, what I, on the basis of what I just now said, that that particular adage is always and everywhere precisely half true. Um, and that means, of course, it's half false. It's not simply a monetary phenomenon. It's a money and goods phenomenon. In other words, it's a money issuance on the one hand and goods production phenomenon on the other hand. And it's always about the relation between those two things. Now, we used to seem to understand this, um, if not theoretically, then at least sort of intuitively, as a polity, as a society, and hence as an economy. Um, you'll note, if you look back in the annals of American economic history, you don't find phenomena like so-called stagflations of the kind that are sort of most notorious from the 1970s until the 1970s, right? In other words, we had inflationary episodes and deflationary episodes from time to time. There were crises, in other words, in the two and a half centuries or the, let's say the two centuries before the 1970s, but you didn't end up typically having stagflationary uh, situations where you have both a slowdown in economic growth on the one hand and rising prices on the other hand. And since that didn't really start until the 1970s, it's of course natural to ask, well, what changed? What sort of went wrong? Well, people will sometimes point, of course, to the oil crises or the oil shocks of the 70s, but it wasn't just that. Um, in effect, what happened in the 1970s is we as a polity on the one hand and economics as an academic discipline on the other hand seem to have lost any conception of production, right? You don't see theories of production. You don't see discussions of production in economics departments in the 1970s any longer. All that sort of goes away. Whereas before that, in the early days, back before there was economics and what we referred to it as was political economy, that was the inquiry, right? I mean, anybody who reads even the Adam Smith book that's always cited by contemporary um, uh, conservatives and sometimes uh, liberal-minded folk alike, anybody who actually reads even just the full title, right? An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, that's a hint right off the bat, right? That the wealth of nations itself is about production, right? That's what's at the core of it. And then it's about what sorts of institutional um, uh, sort of arrangements you have to have to facilitate production, to facilitate actual productive activity that's growing the material wealth of an economy and of a society. And all of the so-called political economists throughout the 19th century were focused on that. But when economics as a discipline began to move off of that in the later 19th and early 20th century, that was the first sign that something wasn't going to be right, right? That something was going to go wrong. It was bound to happen uh, once, you know, economists sort of lost sight of production or ceased talking about production. And then once, you know, the whole idea of production was just sort of lost to public discourse altogether, starting in the 1970s, it was just, you know, it was all but inevitable that we were going to see happen effectively what we've seen happening over the last number of decades, right? So we outsourced production abroad. We basically relied on others to produce the things that we consume, the things that we need, even the things that our military needs at this point, to the point where it's become an actual national security issue in addition to an economic issue. And then um, the sort of uh, policy, saw, the sort of the, the counter, the, the I guess you could say a policy consequence of this or one sort of obvious expression of this is we no longer talk about fiscal policy any longer. We no, really, no longer really talk about things that Congress can do or that the White House can do to facilitate production. We just, in effect, while we've outsourced our production, say, to China, we've outsourced our economic management to the central bank which deals only with monetary policy. In other words, it deals only with what Milton Friedman referred to. And you know the old saying, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, the 
central bank, the Fed only has a hammer. In other words, it only has monetary policy to work with. And that's only half of the sort of scissors in a sense, in a sense that we need to, do, to conduct policy. I do think the scissors metaphor is helpful here too, right? You, you, you don't really have a tool in, in the form of scissors unless you have both blades. And we seem to have just sort of broken apart the scissors and just tossed one of the blades over into the East River or something. And so naturally when you know we're trying to kind of clip the paper, nothing gets clipped, nothing happens. You're just sort of waving a blade around and causing all sorts of destruction. And that's of course what I think over-reliance on monetary policy alone is doing is it's causing destruction, it's wreaking havoc. And we're seeing it constantly, you know, year after year after year, it's always either an overinflated economy, be it um, in the um, in the financial markets, like in the lead up to 2008 or nine, or you have an overinflated uh, consumer goods economy, like we've had since the, um, the outbreak of the pandemic, when we, again, should have been looking at supply, um, since there were obviously supply crunches that were occurring, partly because we were having to shut down productive facilities, and partly because, of course, the supply chains, the, the, the shipping routes and so forth, were being all mucked up by the, by the pandemic. So what does this mean we have to do now? Well, it means that we have to do something along the lines of what Alfeca uh, described and what Ellen uh, just described. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, how might that look? And it happens to be the case that we do have this kind of wonderful winning model that has served us well as a polity ever since the United States got started. And I sort of think of it as the sort of production side and monetary side being handled simultaneously. In other words, both blades of the scissors are handled, right? And we've done this again and again. So going back to uh, the very earliest days of our polity as an independent entity, once we broke free uh, of Great Britain, the Hamiltonian vision combined two things, right? There was on the one hand, a first bank of the US, which was partly a development bank and partly a kind of central bank of the Fed variety. But at the same time, Hamilton's Treasury Department was financing an entity or an organization called the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufacturers. It had set up the very first factories in the United States as, in effect, public-private partnerships over in Patterson, New Jersey. And the reason they set those up in Patterson was, of course, Patterson has lots of great hydropower. So they were even green new dealing before there was any talk about a new deal or about the need to greenify uh, back in the late 18th century in Patterson, New Jersey. So you had that kind of production side that was being worked on by a public-private partnership, thanks to Hamilton on the one hand, and then the, the financing side in the form of, again, a kind of national development bank cum money modulator, which is what the first bank of the U.S. was. We repeated that formula uh, during the Lincoln administration, right? So people sort of forget that there was actually a production effort on the part of the United States government during the, during the Civil War. At that time, the productive, the sort of the, the, the czar, you might say, of, of US production was the quartermaster general's office. It was a military office, but effectively what the quartermaster general under Lincoln had to do was to boost, to, to essentially to lever up, you know, just massively the production of all sorts of basic materials that were needed to prosecute the war against the rebellious South in order to win that war. So the Lincoln administration and uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, Salmon Chase and the Quartermaster General's office were basically engineering a nationwide productive boom in order to be able to outproduce the South and then to sort of end the Civil War as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, you also had a really critical form of monetary reform of a key, uh, you know, to sort of help finance the effort. And that was, of course, uh, a series of three enactments, the National Bank Act, the Currency Act, and the Legal Tender Act of 1862, three and four, that gave us our system of national currency that is essentially managed centrally by a central governmental authority. That's when all of that started. And that was when the dollar, as we know it, the greenback, as it was called back then, was first introduced. And that's when credit money as something that was issued by a federal authority without reliance on or, inhib or any sort of constraint imposed by reliance on precious metals like gold or silver, that's when that got started. And so you had that same combination of a, a sort of centralized monetary system and financing system combined with a centralized production system. Then in the First World War, we had to do the thing, the whole thing again, right? So during, in order to sort of boost up uh, production for the war and to finance it, we established a war finance corporation on the one hand, handling the financing and banking side of things, and then a war industries board, which was again, the production coordinator. 
And then at the time of the Great Depression and then the Second World War during the Roosevelt years, essentially the old war uh, finance corporation or the WFC was recreated, but it was called now the Reconstruction Finance Corporation of the RFC. And the old War Industries Board was reestablished and it was called the War Production Board. And the WPB basically coordinated a massive productive effort and it made this economy by far the most productive in the world where the US accounted for literally 60% of global production by the end of the Second World War, and none of it was inflationary, as 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 Ellen showed you. Her her graphs are just so striking, and I hope maybe Ellen will even put them up again because it's astonishing when you think about how much more we were producing by the end of the Second World War, and how none of that was inflationary. And it's not simply because of price controls; it's because we managed the financing intelligently, and we continue to do something kind of like that in a more sort of subdued, kind of sub rosa sort of way. For, de for a couple of decades after the war, we couldn't be too in your face about it at the time because people were worried it's going to look like socialism and we're in the middle of this thing called a Cold War. So we don't want to look too much like the Soviets who are our mortal enemies, even though in many ways we were, right? I mean, in a sense, we did have our own sort of goth plan. It just wasn't as micromanaging. It was simply coordinating. But that's effectively what we let go. That's what we let disappear over the course of the 70s. We let the production migrate elsewhere so we don't produce anymore. And we lost sight of what you know, sort of sensible public finance policy should look like and how it should be a kind of handmaiden to production. It should be, and it's essentially complementary to production. We lost sight of that as well. So that now all we have is this kind of strange one-bladed scissors, this sort of one-armed uh, boxer, in effect, in the form of a government. It's just not able to, to sort of keep things running on an even keel. So I think that the effort that Alfeca and, um, and Ellen have been behind for, for, for years now, and that they're really um, putting forward so elegantly now, is really critical, a real critical piece of our sort of recapturing of what we once were and our reestablishment of our, our own sort of Hamiltonian uh, ways. And it seems to me that's the only way that you can have a sustainable, long-term, productive, and non-inflationary, non-deflationary mixed economy of the kind that the US economy has always been when it's been at its best, where the public sector does what it does best, to coordinate and to provide financing where it can't be privately provided because the profit motive simply doesn't incentivize it to produce things that people can't capture profits off of, like essential infrastructures, for example. So the public sector does that, and then that puts in place all of the prerequisites to enable the private sector's profit motive to move in directions that are actually productive rather than merely speculative. That's what we need to do. That's what we have to reestablish. And that's, I think, what this particular effort, the National Infrastructure Bank, is really all about. So it's historically immensely important. Uh, and it seems to be that it's economically immensely essential. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Professor Hockett, for that explanation. And now that we have heard uh, the theoretical underpinnings in support of the National Infrastructure Bank, we are going to change it up a little bit and go to some of our feet on the street. And these would be some of the representatives around the country that are supporting the National Infrastructure Bank and working hard in their areas of the country to get resolutions passed and get their um, Congress people to support it. So first, I would like to go to um, Assemblyman Felix Ortiz. He is the assist former assistant speaker of the New York Assembly and has been very active in our movement for a National Infrastructure Bank. Felix? Well, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. It is a great honor to be with all of you tonight. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's raining and we're expecting a lot of snow in New York State. I think that the climate change is real. Uh, now we're beginning to feel the pressure of the weather. Uh, and I hope that that weather will translate into work. Uh, saying that, uh, we had a wonderful, uh, I think we, we had a wonderful year. I think we're gonna continue to have a better year in 2023. I, uh, I would like to report that uh, we was very pleased uh, to have a great conversation with Senator Gillibrand's staff as well Representative Cortez. Thank you to Mark and others who uh, were able to really get these people on the table. And also, I would like to report that uh, Senator Lujan uh, uh, spoke with uh, Senator uh, Bernie Sander, which I think 
uh, that's uh, that can be a turning point uh, if Bernie Sanders really begin to uh, be a cheerleader uh, on this uh, uh, on this resolution. As well, the uh, National Asian Pacific just had a meeting uh, a few days ago. Uh, it's a big kind of association about Asian Pacific as well as uh, Na Native American, and they passed a re resolution supporting uh, Congressman David uh, resolution, which is our resolution as well. So this is uh, this is a very encouraging what has been happening uh, so far, and also we met with uh, uh, a delegate from Maryland. Uh, who show a lot of interest. And I will tell you this much for those of you who sometimes join us at nighttime uh, for this meeting, it's a lot of stuff that is happening during the daytime. And I don't know how Becca and Stuart can put all this together uh, uh, between the hours of night to whatever we get together at eight o'clock, but I've been pulled out from my stuff to go to, go to some meeting for half an hour and 15 minutes. And it's, a, and it's encouraging to see the energy that these individual have and, and, and the dedication. And I think they deserve a big round of applause and a, and a big commendation uh, for their dedications. Uh, because for some of us who, you know, uh, being asked and, and we're trying to call our Congress person or we're trying to push our Congress delegation, uh, you know, these people really uh, are behind the scene uh, ch chatting and talking and, and dealing with uh, city council, uh, mayors, uh, state legislators. And I can, like I said to them before, and I said it again, I cannot wait until 1231, 2022 is over because uh, beginning January 1st, I'm allowed to talk to legislators in New York State. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention is that um, uh, a follow up letter. Uh, was sent from me to uh, uh, Congress, uh, Congresswoman Cortez, as well as Senator Gillibrand. And once uh, January, uh, like I said, once January hit on the road, uh, I will say that more, more of those letters will come directly from me to my legislators as well. Uh, and, uh, and I think that at that point, I'm allowed to do uh, uh, to advocate for, for the resolution in more deep in New York State. Uh, lastly, I would like also to to point out that uh, uh, Congressman Paul Tonka, who is from uh, Albany, New York, uh, has shown interest finally. Uh, I would like to say to you that I spoke to uh, Paul uh, during COVID, and that was in 2019 <laughs> when I saw Paul uh, in Albany. And uh, he said, yeah, 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 we'll contact them and have them contact me. But finally, I said, uh, I think uh, one of the, important thing that we should not forget that this midterm election was a trivializer, was a wake up call. Uh, it was like, a, was like, a, like a, everyone was not expecting things to happen this way. But when you have a majority of 222, any Congress person there can twist around if they don't know how to control them and the game is over. You know, things can change very quick in, in Washington. So therefore, I think we have a wonderful window of, of opportunity right now uh, uh, after the the midterm the, the midterm election, where both parties are going to try to really try to digest what this resolution really is all about, what this resolution can offer that is different from what we have done, and it's very simple. I think the prior three speaker has articulated very well that is. Uh, it is only one issue here. We need to get Congress together, act together and put them to work. So for those of you who are new on the call, I would like to re-emphasize, please, uh, contact your US senators, contact your congressional delegation. And uh, the only way we're going to get this done, which is very critical, is from the bottom up. From the bottom up. And we, for some of us who are former legislators, we know how to do it. For those of us who have for those of you who are still elected, you know how to do it. And let's, uh, let's really continue to galvanize and put the pressure to this delegation because two years from now, it's gonna be another election. And a lot of the economics has been predicted that 2023, January, February, March, and so on, the energy cost is gonna go escalating and the groceries and the food is gonna be escalating. So poor will continue to be poor, rich will continue to be rich. And I see Rebecca Wallin was mentioned that, and I will echo that as well. So I would like to wish every single one of you a wonderful holiday, whichever way you celebrate with all your family. May God bless you all. Let's keep the faith, let's continue working hard. 
and will be a different Felix Ortiz in 2023. Thank you, Felix. Really appreciate that. Uh, next, I would like to go to Assemblyman Don Guardian of New Jersey. Uh, he is on the New Jersey State Assembly and is the former mayor of Atlantic City. Welcome, Don Guardian. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to join you to discuss the uh, uh, National Infrastructure uh, Bank. Um, I, I can't imagine why we're not already there. Um, it's amazing that only four of our presidents uh, realize the need for one. Um, if you're joining our call, uh, let me tell you that there's not another single developed country that doesn't have an infrastructure bank. Whether you come from the East Coast of the United States, like I do in New Jersey, where we've been here for 300 years, uh, the needs that we have for roads and tunnels and bridges and affordable housing and water lines and uh, resources to provide energy for our future all exceed the ability for municipalities, counties, and states to be able to uh, afford them. So it becomes critical to have an infrastructure bank. This is such a well thought out idea using bonds that are already exists. So we're not tapping into additional uh, property tax dollars or printing money to fund these programs, but rather a logical way of, of uh, using the bonds uh, creating the $5 trillion, uh, at least for the first five years, to start this process going. On, on a very minute scale, the town right below Atlantic City um, is uh, Ventnor, New Jersey. It's a very affluent town, but they need to replace all of their water lines, not only in the street, but also going into the individual homes. The cost of that would be five times what their annual city budget is. So it's beyond even an affluent town to be able to afford the very basic necessities, in this case, clean drinking waters for, for their residents. So this is a logical way. This is certainly not a Democrat or Republican or, or independent uh, group thinking it. Th this is what our country needs in order to move forward. It's certainly well thought out. Um, again, as my counterpart in New York had said, it's our obligation, if you're buying in, you realize the importance to talk to our congressmen, our senators, uh, to make sure that we get them to be attractive. I can tell you that you've been good enough to let me join and maybe six or more of uh, these uh, uh, group chats uh, through Zoom and every uh, individual in New Jersey that's a legislature, and I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans, ha once they heard about five minutes, there was this was a no-brainer. Let, let's do this. What do I need to do? How can I sign on? How can we uh, push uh, Congress to uh, have this going on? Uh, we can't afford to wait any longer. We know we have the infrastructure that's uh, needed to be repaired. Now we need to have a, a source of funding. And with all honesty, five trillion, I think, is just the beginning. The first five years, when we see what the uh, great need is uh, among uh, everyone, but certainly affecting our urban areas, our poor areas of the country, we realize that uh, Americans are in a position they can't help themselves. They don't have enough funding to do this. We need to attract and attack this on a, a national basis, an infrastructure bank bank is just an excellent idea to get get us there. So I strongly ask everyone to be supportive. If you'd like to talk to me individually, please uh, uh, give them my email, my text, my private cell. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have if there's anyone that's still hesitant after listening to some of the speakers today. And I thank you guys for uh, your uh, ability to stay with this and to persevere uh, because we will get this done. Thank you, Don. Appreciate all your comments. Uh, next. Next, we're going to move on to uh, Maine, where we have uh, former Senator Dave Miramont on. Dave? Hello, and thank you very much for letting me join you tonight. It's uh, great to 
speak to folks who have been as excited as I am about getting this done. Too many of the structures we have now in government are going to keep folks who are already rich, richer, corporations richer, where they use the money to make laws and policies that make them richer. And we're seeing this income inequality affect every level. Pretty soon we're going to have it where if you want infrastructure done, you're supposed to get a GoFundMe page. It's gotten that bad in this country. So we did pass a resolution to encourage our DC delegation to pass a law for a national infrastructure bank. I have to echo the sentiments of a previous speaker about the energy and enthusiasm of Stuart and the group. And we all are glad to participate in the effort, but for someone like Stu and everybody that's behind the scenes to tell us at the right time where to go, who to talk to, that's a, a really important thing because I also found that as long as you got someone to slow down and listen, they came away shaking their head, yes, let me know more. And when they knew more, they wanted to, well, for one thing, vote for it, but they passed it on to others. The only people we didn't seem to get were those who wouldn't bother to look at it or who were told by their party that there was something wrong so they wouldn't look at it based on that. And they also wouldn't vote for it because they just go along with what a particular party's ideologies are. And this is another one of those that's all over the map. In one place, it may be the Republicans have decided that it, it's something they don't want and they just go against it. In another place, they're wide open to it. So education is the biggest thing. It's what worked here in Maine. Not that I can say that we got many Republicans on. It's uh, what happens, but it moved forward and we can get it to move forward in Washington. I am sad that for two years, we won't, I won't be able to affect my fellow legislators here in Maine, but there are other jobs and I wanna keep you all enthused that every little bit moves it forward. The successes that have already happened are, are a positive and encouraging thing. So keep at it. And uh, we may be able to start giving some power back to the people of this country. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dave, appreciate those comments. Uh, we're gonna keep moving right along here as we're almost uh, uh, used up an hour. So uh, I wanna go across the country now to New Mexico. New Mexico, as you might know, is in the midst of a huge drought that is affecting uh, their area, affecting agriculture in, in uh, New Mexico. And we have with us today, Mark Strand, the secretary treasurer of the New Mexico Federation of Labor. That's the AFL-CIO. And uh, Mark has been very involved in our efforts to move forward a national infrastructure bank, including a recent meeting at the White House. Mark, can you give us a, a rundown? Yes, thank you. Um, mostly what I wanted to do is I wanted to brief you on the two major meetings that we had here in the state of New Mexico. Our first one, we were able to schedule 30 minutes with Ben Ray Lujan. At the end of the 30 minutes, his staff was telling me he needed to move on and he still stayed with us for another 15 minutes answering and asking questions and really participating. It was great to hear what he had to say. And then as Felix Ortiz mentioned earlier, he then went up past that and talked to Bernie Sanders about it. So our movement there went not just to him, he's moving it on himself, which is a great achievement there. Then yesterday we were able to talk to Mary Carlson, who is part of the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, she was very interested in what we had to say. She understands our water crisis here and she promised to move it up the chain. So we're anxious to see what her involvement does as we move up. The other thing I'd like to say is that, you know what, it is so important that you reach out to your congressmen. They're the ones that listen. They listen to the voters. You are the voters of your state. When you reach out to them, they pay attention. And then when you get their attention, contact the National Infrastructure Team because they do an amazing job selling this. We have an amazing product out there. It works. It's worked in the past and they can sell it to them like nobody else. It is great to watch them work, see the way they bring it all together and the way they move it forward. They just do an incredible job. It's just up to all of us to make sure that we reach out to our congressmen and move it forward. And when you get that meeting set up with them, 
reach out to the team because they have your back and they do an incredible job selling this. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate that exciting update from New Mexico. Next, I'd like to go to the middle of the country where we have Craig Swartz here from Ohio. He's a recent uh, candidate for Congress there and spent months uh, stumping around the rural areas of uh, Ohio. So Craig, uh, tell me about what's happening there. Um, well, we're going to reach out to uh, local uh, trustees, uh, as I said before, the previous uh, Zoom call. I believe we need to take the message right to the people because they don't know what they don't know. Uh, when I was covering 12 counties in my race uh, this past cycle, I would come across these township trustees, speak to peace about uh, the NIB, and it was immediate attention. Like, like David Merrimont just said, you're going to be reaching these people and educating them. And once you get five minutes with them, they walk away with like, wow, I had never heard that before. And I want to like echo a little bit what uh, Professor Hawk was talking about in terms of the, the rural. When you try to connect with these people, the things that were happening historically in the early 20th century, late 19th century, with the Grange Wars and everything else, the farmers were rising against the mercantile interest at the time. And you saw it was all about the grain elevators. And all around this area, it's just about reminding the people the power they used to have and the, 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 the modern-day version of what they created with that public buy, uh, financing is ad credit which still exists today. And I was just having a conversation with somebody. And when I was talking about the NIB, there's the connection. And that's what we could be doing going forward with the NIB. We're gonna get these state legislators on board. We're gonna get these people at a local level interested in turning it around because we have to break the cycle. These Republicans won't debate us. We won't get the coverage as candidates in this neck of the woods. This is the task ahead of us. But once you reach the people and you break it down to the trustee level, local level, let it percolate up. Like I thought was talking about before, you know, before we're going to turn the tide. This is something that's, again, you're just reminding them of their history. You're bringing them back because it's been 40 decades. When I first came here 20 years ago, we lost all of these manufacturing jobs. They were all getting sucked out at that time. And this is what these people are remembering, and that's what that is what is fomented a lot of the anger, the disconnect, discontent right now that we're facing. And again, with the media and stuff like that, it's it is a tough task for us to be presenting these ideas. But once they get there and you get through the noise, it makes a big difference. So it, the task ahead, I am so recommitted to something like this. I joined on because I lived in Germany. In 1980, and I saw what their, their economy was doing. They are export driven. They have public financing right down to the local level. I lived in France and during the Minotron uh, years, early 80s, and saw what they were doing with their public financing and, re and reinvested in their railroads and their home metro system. So I've lived through it, and I was in London uh, during the Thatcher years, and I saw exactly what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> So I'm so enthused about uh, you know, being part of this and I could speak to anybody and I, I definitely want to bring it down to the local regional levels here. Hey, thank you, Craig, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I do want to take the opportunity to let people know that here in the Pacific Northwest, we've recently had a couple of great meetings, one with Republican Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska's staff on the National Infrastructure Bank. And then we also met with uh, staff for Democratic Senator Patty Murray from Washington. So again, we're making efforts all across the country to meet with uh, our members of Congress. Uh, our bill is currently introduced in the House and we're looking for a lead senator or two or five to introduce it into the Senate. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, uh, show a couple slides here on some of the uh, other, uh, the latest resolutions that we've had passed by organizations around the country. Mark, do you have those slides? So um, a resolution was recently passed by the National Asian Pacific American Caucus of State Legislators. So one of our uh, state legislators in Washington state that's very uh, active, Bob Hasegawa introduced this resolution there and it, and it was approved. So we're thrilled um, to have that resolution um, uh, booked uh, next. Uh, and here we have the city of Los Angeles came out supporting the National Infrastructure Bank. Next. 
Um, this is a resolution from Florida, from the Miami-Dade Transportation Planning Organization. Certainly Florida has huge infrastructure needs and uh, we really appreciate the, um, the support from, of this group from Miami. And one more. And here we have uh, from the middle of the country, the Indiana Passenger Rail Alliance uh, has come out and supported the National Infrastructure Bank. So again, we're getting groups around the country. We've had nationwide organizations come out and support the infrastructure bank. So if and when you call your member of Congress in your area, it could very well be that they have already heard about this and they just need a little bit of additional pushing from their constituents to move forward to set up their own meeting to discuss how they can help support a national infrastructure bank. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions and answers. Um, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we will call on you. And I see Dennis Montoya from New Mexico. Dennis, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, just a comment that what you have um, just finished describing is incredibly important and that inertia is difficult to break at the beginning, but once that momentum builds, uh, we're starting to see the results. Uh, it is no small thing that Senator Ben Ray Lujan from New Mexico is talking to Senator Bernie Sanders. They are not exactly birds of a feather, uh, by no means enemies, uh, but um, it's a sign of the times. And uh, it's a sign that the Democratic Party is becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of the Federal Reserve inducing um, economic hardship for everyday working Americans. And we have a solution and they're starting to listen. So now's no time for us to slow down. I think we need to keep it up. Uh, as Mark points out, you guys do a tremendous job in the coalition of getting their attention. Uh, Alfeca has a presentation entitled What's Not to Like, and I think every one of us should memorize that presentation. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate those comments. And next, uh, I am thrilled to see that Mary Jane Shimsky is on the call. She has recently been a uh, elected to the New York State Assembly. Uh, it's been a, uh, a driving force between our efforts there in New York. Mary Jane, can you um, give us an update on what what's happening in your area? There is increasing interest in the National Infrastructure Bank among members of the New York State Legislature. Um, the legislature does not do resolutions in New York but they do, um, they do letters of support. And um, we're going to make a push early this session to get a large number of assembly members to sign on to it. Um, I just wanna say in terms of what the theme of tonight was, it is frightening how many people who are either in government or even have economics degrees, don't understand um, macroeconomics. Now, Alfeca can give you all the details with multipliers and everything, but in addition to getting us stuff that we desperately need, whether it's roads, bridges, housing, wastewater treatment plants, and so on, what the National Infrastructure Bank will do is create well-paying jobs that will help support the middle class again, and we'll definitely um, improve our short, medium, and long-term economic prospects. Um, and we'll even help the people who think the one who um, gets the most toys wins because they don't get as many toys if everyone else is not prosperous. This will help improve the prosperity of large segments of the country which have not been seeing a lot of bright um, prosperity in recent decades. So it's still one more reason to uh, get on board with this. 
Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary Jane. Really appreciate you being here and uh, participating in our call. Uh, I would next like to go to another state, Virginia. We have Lou Spencer on, and he is um, with the labor in uh, Virginia, the, uh, I think, building council. Lou? Yes, hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, I'm driving home. It's late. I just got off Interstate 95. My name is Lou Spencer. I'm the assistant business manager with Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local 5. We are an affiliate of the Virginia Building and Construction Trades Council. My international union passed a resolution back in 2021 in support of the National Infrastructure Bank and uh, the small county where I live, Essex County, Virginia. Very rural, very conservative. The Board of Supervisors there um, passed a resolution uh, probably a year or two ago on, in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. So um, I think we're doing a wonderful job. Uh, the coalition had a good meeting with Sam Rasool, a delegate from Southwest Virginia uh, this past Monday. Um, a lot of good questions, a lot of good exchange, and uh, we continue to push this. And uh, one trip down Interstate 95 will tell you that you need the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, we need better roads, better bridges, better water treatment plants, uh, the whole works. So uh, thanks for listening and um, keep, up, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Appreciate you being here. Now, I believe Kimberly Sims from the Seattle area had her hand up with a question. Kim, are you with us? I am. Yes, thank you. Um, on this coming Tuesday, we're going to be meeting with a representative from uh, Representative Jayapal's office. And I want to be sure that um, I can let her know the, the resolution that Bob Hasegawa has put forward. So can you tell me again what that is? Um, the most recent one that was passed by the Asian Pacific. Yes. Um, let's see if I have it here in my notes. It is the National Asian Pacific American Caucus of State Legislators. So that would be a nationwide group. Okay, thank you very much. And Julie, are you gonna be on that? call yes this. okay great thank yep, you i will be yep thanks we're uh looking forward to it. definitely be great to get um uh our member of congress there from washington um in support okay um any other questions um oh look we've got uh edith frederick uh with her hand up edith has she gone away Okay. That wasn't that was a mistake. I was wanted to applaud the last speaker and every other speaker helping us to deepen our understanding so that we can be strong advocates because that's what it's going to take all of us being strong, learned, <laughs> eloquent uh, advocates as you all you are. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for those kind remarks. Okay, we have uh, Marion Marion Murphy with her hand up. Uh, <clears throat> I'm attending from Boulder, Colorado. I'm interested just because I saw the resolution. Is that something that is a standard way of writing it, or do you have some examples of the kinds of resolutions? I, I'll bet the name will change, but that you uh, process. Yeah. Yes, we have many examples uh, that can be used, and. Uh, We'll have somebody from the coalition office contact you and we'll be able to provide sample templates. I mean, they vary a little bit depending on uh, where the resolution is going to be put forward. Is it going to be the legislature? Is it a nonprofit organization and that sort of thing? But we're definitely happy to help you out um, and provide that information um, for you. Uh, we had another question that came in on the chat. This is for Professor Hockett and we had um, one of our uh, listeners wondering about um, industry consolidation and the effect that that has on inflation. And would you be able to address that, um, Professor? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a, another piece of the inflation story at the moment, in addition to the, the lack of sufficient production to absorb the additional money that was issued by necessity during the pandemic. And that is that the price rises seem to be being led uh, by record profits rather than by record wages or salaries. In other words, the inflation rate is much higher at the moment than is the growth rate of wage or salary income. 
And at the same time, it's much slower um, than the rate of growth of, uh, of profit taking in the last couple of years. And you don't have to be, you know, Jacob Bernoulli or a, a famous statistician to sort of understand that if one rate is leading um, a particular salient data point and another rate is lagging that salient data point, then the leading indicator is probably the salient one, right? The most important one uh, where the cause is. And so it does seem to be, you know, without question um, that record profits are driving the inflation from the demand side, at least, um, at least I shouldn't say the demand side, but from the, the supply side, at least in so far as it's not just a matter of supply constraints. In other words, there's a kind of, there seems to be a sort of symbiotic effect um, at work here where you have supply shortages that induce some initial price rises. Then you see um, when those price rises begin and people are sort of tolerating them and accommodating themselves to them by going ahead and purchasing stuff, even at those higher uh, weight, at those higher prices, um, you see, you know, basically corporate executives taking advantage of the fact and saying, hey, it looks like people will, you know, tolerate higher prices. And so they'll start jacking up the prices even further. And we, we not only have the, st the stats that show that this is what's happening, again, because the profit growth rate is much higher than the inflation rate, whereas the wage and salary growth rate is much lower than the inflation rate. So we not only have that, those stats, but we have all sorts of anecdotal evidence, right? There have been reports of literally hundreds, if not thousands of shareholder calls by various mm -hmm. corporate CEOs who are sort of boasting to the shareholders, you know, how well they're doing now with profits. And they are just apparently shameless. They're coming right out and, and chortling with sort of self-satisfaction about how successful they're proving to be in this effort. They'll say, well, now that everybody expects prices to go up because there's inflation and the media keeps talking about it, we can go ahead and raise prices and people don't blame us for it. Nobody sort of gets angry or resentful and look at all the additional money we're raking. And, and so you see profit rates, again, at record highs. You also see share buyback activity, which is typically a function of that up at record rates as well. None of that is productive, of course, and none of that has anything has any effect at all in increasing supplies. So my own view for what it's worth is that in addition to working on the supply side in the, in the sense of actually boosting production back home and bringing back high paying industrial type jobs back here to the States, in addition to that, we really ought to be looking at profit taking and we ought to be looking at share buyback activity and we ought to be prohibiting it again because we did used to prohibit that sort of thing. And we didn't permit price gouging during the shortages during the Second World War either, by the way. So while it's a little bit sort of ancillary to the, the question of the NIB, it's nevertheless complementary um, to what we're trying to do with the NIB. And indeed, a lot of our efforts with the NIB effort, if we were to bring about you know, increasing production, the the sort of the salutary effects of that increasing production would definitely be there would be a lag between our actually boosting the production and the benefits beginning to get through the economy if profiteering was going on so the sooner we can sort of stop that while restarting production um in my humble opinion the better thank you professor hockett uh now what i'd like to do um is briefly go to uh some of our current or former uh legislators that are on the phone uh, we're asking people on this call to contact your member of Congress or your state legislators to gain support for the National Infrastructure Bank. And I'd like to hear from uh, some of the folks with experience, what would be the most effective way in contacting your local uh, legislators or member of Congress? Is it phone calls? Is it emails? Should you send them uh, the downloadable brochure from the NIB website? Um, how about if we go to Dave? Dave Miramont. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, we're a small state, so it's personal. I, I know all four of our uh, congressional representatives, and it's easy to do that. And there are many states of folks who are on here that can do that. In the large states, I, I'm not quite sure what the best process would be, but in the small states, I hope you just make the connection. One of the things that happens, at least in Maine, and I think I see it in most places, the folks that are working in the smaller offices become the staff people for the Senate in the state Senate or the state house. And then as they, if they're good, then they move on to our uh, Washington senators and representatives. So you've made connections with them on the way. So give them a call at their office and you'll get right through to getting something done. So if you haven't done that already, please do it. If I ever need to talk to 
uh, Representative Pingree or Golden or Senator King, I just call their staff or most of the time it's their chief of staff because they were my aide back here in Maine. So if you haven't used those connections, I think that's about the best going because they have unlimited time. And not only that, they'll invite you for a tour you know, or something <laughs> fun. I mean, maybe you can't do it right now, but it's a great connection. So that's my best thing for going. Wonderful. Thank you. We, we appreciate that advice. And uh, if anybody else has any advice on how to contact your legislator, please put your hand up. And um, I did, I want to go to Craig, Craig Swartz. I saw your hand up here a minute ago. Well, it's not in connection with what you were just asking, but uh, I think one of the other connections that can be made with conservatives and libertarians, though, uh, overall with our message, is that I think deep down a, there's a little bit of a distrust with what's going on with the Federal Reserve. Um, and the approach could be the NIB again. There's a non-transparency with the, uh, as we know, with the Federal Reserve. I'd like to ask actually Professor Hockett a question. Earlier this year, the Fed announced that they were going to start disposing sale of their toxic assets that they've been holding for quite some time, I think since the uh, 08 crash. And that had to have been an enormous amount of money that they were going to be disposing in a short period of time. So what I would like to know is, is, is this cover simply hiking the rates? Is it, I'm sorry, is it what, Craig? It's sort of like just a cover because they were disposing the assets, I think earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken. And so you're asking, is it cover? Yeah. Oh, you're just gonna tighten the money supply? You're oh, gonna no, yeah, I mean, that's probably part of it, right? I mean, when they resell the stuff, they're, of course, taking money out of the economy, or at least they're taking liquidity out well, they're of going the to, Actually, they're putting it back, though, aren't they? Uh, that's when they purchase the assets. Yeah. Um, when they sell the assets, of course, what they're doing is they're putting out non-legal tender in return for legal tender. So right. it's, a, it's a way of shrinking. Um, this is sort of part of the larger effort that they've tried again and again ever since 2009-10. Uh, to so you know what they call shrink the balance sheet, right? So right. a big part of the the sort of growth of the balance sheet was basically just purchasing all sorts of things that were not money in order to put more money out there in the economy. And then they've tried to shrink the balance sheet a number of times ever since 2009. They always brought about a so-called taper tantrum, you might recall, 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, and then, of course, the balance sheet grew even further uh, during the COVID troubles. And so I think what they're doing is they're, they're sort of, they've got a sort of a two prong effort underway to try to tighten money. One is to sort of shrink the balance sheet back down and then the yeah. other is to, to raise the rate. And again, I mean, as far as shrinking the balance sheet is concerned, if what they're unloading is stuff that they probably shouldn't have been holding in the first place because they're Correct. raising out entities yeah. that weren't deserving, that seems like a, a decent thing to do, um, but on grounds other than controlling inflation, right? It yeah. probably, this is just a great opportunity to do it because they won't have a tantrum this time in doing it. Um, but all of that being said, you know, like probably most people here, I'm a little concerned that the the shrinkage um, and the the sort of the tapering and then the rate rising, the tightening basically, is not very well targeted. So what it's right. doing is it's essentially falling on labor. It's really going to harm yeah. people. And this is something that okay, it's going to really hurt going back to what uh, some of the previous speakers were just talking about, the rural areas. Exactly. And what I've been preaching, I'm so passionate about, is how this NIB reaches the far corners. Not only, uh, and I was pushing it a couple of years ago for State Public Bank, uh, like yeah. North Dakota. Yeah, it's almost like I think the subtext of you know the old Friedman line about inflation always being a monetary phenomenon. I mean, what he's not saying, what Friedman didn't say, but I think what he probably really meant, and what I fear Powell at this point means, and we know Larry Summer means, is that inflation is always and everywhere an uppity labor problem, right? They essentially want labor to stop being uppity, and they want labor to be sort of subservient, subservient and sort of bowing and scraping again. So yeah. there's really these these record profit takers and stock buybackers can keep doing what they're doing and, and chortling about it to their shareholders. But that's benefiting only a very tiny portion of the per population that isn't hurting. And, you know, we ought to be really celebrating the fact uh, that wages and salaries have to some extent come back because they that's were right. stagnant or declining for 50 years straight since the 1970s, right? And, um, you know, a return to something like a, a fair distribution of the surplus produced by the, by the national economy every year as between labor and capital 
seems to me to be something to be celebrating rather than to be sort of horrified about, particularly given that, you know, this, you know, at least in the 70s, a, a case could be made that wages and salaries played some role in driving price rises. Not, I think that it was exaggerated, but there was some role. But at this point, they're not playing any role at all. And again, they're sure. a lagging indicator. So any tightening that the Fed does that's kind of broad brush or blunderbuss in that way is really hurting people that aren't really at fault for, 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 the, for the difficulties that we're faced with right now. And that that worries me. And as Alfeca and, and Ellen know, a lot of my scholarly work before the pandemic was precisely on how we can do more targeted uh, central bank uh, operations, basically to move to what I was calling or analogizing to a fuel injection system rather than to a sloppy carburetor system, right? Where we could actually sort of target the tightening where the tightening was needed and we could target the loosening where the loosening was needed instead of just throwing money at everybody in sight when you needed to sort of expand and then just kind of coming down hard on labor and everybody in sight when you want to tighten. Uh, yeah. So I do think ultimately we do want to move towards some kind of a fuel injection style. Um, uh, that's a, almost a bad metaphor now though, since we're moving to electric vehicles, but those who are old enough to remember the difference between carburetors and fuel injectors, you'll, you'll get what I'm getting at. I do think we want to move toward that form of central banking. And a lot of the writing that I have out there in the scholarly sphere is on that. Most of it, of course, is from before 2020 or 2021, because of course, since then, we've had to focus on other things, especially getting production back. And the, the NIB, of course, is right at the core of all of that. Yeah. But Thank thanks, you. Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Good question, Craig. Um, okay, I'd, um, I understand uh, Representative Beavers is on the phone. And uh, uh, could you sh share some insight with us, Bobby? Well, I can't add much to <laughs> to what Dave said. He He kind of hit it, the nail on the head as far as you know, making contacts with chiefs of staff and uh, and that sort of that type of person uh, to get to the uh, actual senator or representative. And uh, so far, we've only been able to get Shelley uh, Pingree on board, but uh, there's still work to be done to try and get our other rep and our two senators. Wonderful. What do you what do you think's best, phone or email or both? Actually, both. You have to stay on top of it. Uh, okay. Thank you. Good. Good. Good advice. How about Assemblyman Ortiz? Felix, do you have an opinion on this? What's the best way to get in the loop with your local legislators? I think all of the above. I think that every single one of the folks that I spoke, I think I support uh, their comment. Uh, I think that's messaging uh, and developing a time of press release, press statement uh, on a Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, and hashtag uh, the U.S. of Congress, member of Congress, and the U.S. Senator. That could be very helpful. Uh, I think we have a resolution. We have some little talking points, uh, and we should say it. Uh, I, Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, retired assistant speaker, hashtag support this resolution is good for our community, for our people, hashtag U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer, U.S. Gillibrand, and take the congressional delegation. And I think that we need to Twitter and hashtag every single one of them as well. That's another avenue of doing it. And, and furthermore, I would say that for those of you who are still elected, I think holding, holding a small press conference with a uh, grassroots people who are willing to support the resolution or the concept of the resolution uh, and the language uh, uh, and calling on Congress to support the initiative as well. Uh, that also is very helpful. That's something that I used a lot when I was elected uh, on my uh, bills, I mean, uh, my legislations. And let me just tell you, I was very, I was very successful on getting things done because of that. So I think that's another avenue. Uh, get a, get some member from different area where different representatives are attached to that member and hold a press conference in the Capitol or hold a press conference uh, where, we, where we just to call uh, many days, many months ago, a day of action and have city council, state assembly, the state senate, even if it's from the same district or in different places, holding a press conference with five or six people supporting the initiative and calling we're calling our U.S. congressman, our U.S. senator to support this initiative, blah, 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 blah. I think that's important as well. 
and, and resonate with the local paper. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, call on Marilyn Chase. She was one of our local legislators in Washington State. Marilyn, can you weigh in with us? Most of the suggestions that, that we've had so far tonight have been, um, there I am, okay, have been um, right on target. Uh, but as I listened to the discussion, I thought, you know, one of the things that we have not really done in a sustained way is to bring our message to the municipal governments that we have. In my county, um, I think we have something like, you know, or maybe in King County, we have like 33 uh, little cities. Uh, all of them are, are really hurting for money and for ways to to build their infrastructure. They they have a problem and we have a solution. And I I just as, as I just was thinking, you know, maybe we should go at that level uh, because all of the the uh, Congress people and the senators pay good attention to the local uh, local municipalities. So I'm, I might give that a shot out here and see what happens. Thank you. We appreciate that. I don't, I don't know if you heard, but the Los Angeles City Council just endorsed yeah, the, uh, yeah. the National Infrastructure Bank. And here in my home state of Alaska, the city of Anchorage, the largest city in the state, endorsed it. So I, I definitely think that's a great idea. Obviously, we want to build support um, wherever we can. And starting with our our local city governments is a, a great place to start. Yeah, and I think asking them to help us get line up uh, uh, sponsors, ask them to, you know, they've, they're on a first name basis with all of the, the uh, senators and, and the congressmen and women. And uh, so I think at, we should make the ask, tell them we want them to help us because we're trying to get money for their projects. That's right. And I'm sure they would appreciate it. You know, everyone appreciates having a source of financing to, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. take care of a problem, address an issue in their area. So, um, you know, we're bringing a solution to the table. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? So, um, Seeing none, I would like to thank everybody for their attendance here this evening. I'd like to move on. We've got a few final slides we want to share with everyone. So um, we do have an action page on our website. And so if you're wondering what you can do in your area um, to help out or you know see what kinds of things we're working on, please go to our website and check out our action page. Also on our website, we have a downloadable brochure that, um, that you would be able to print out and give to your local representative or your city council or the mayor of your town or to your neighbors. If you're trying to get some of your neighbors on board to, um, to uh, make phone calls with you. So please check out our action page on our website. And then we have another slide. Okay. And uh, please call your member of Congress and uh, tell them that you support um, the National Infrastructure Bank and you'd like their support as well. We are happy to do Zoom meetings with uh, any member of Congress or their staff. So ask them if we can set up a Zoom meeting. Um, we want them to co-sponsor HR 3339, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank Act. We have another um, slide and here we go. So for more information, you can go to our website. We do have a Facebook page. We're on Twitter. We have an email address. So please contact us. We are here to support you and your local areas. We're making a big push for additional co-sponsors in the House and for uh, senators to introduce this bill in the Senate and uh, we can uh, use your support. So thanks again, everyone, for being here this evening. Um, happy holidays to, to everyone. And we'll look forward to uh, meeting with you again in 2023. Thank thanks, everyone.